I'd like to ask about groundwater. We, by accident, live on top of the second largest freshwater system on Earth. Do we have any special responsibilities as citizens of Nebraska for this global resource? Nebraska is home to the Ogallala Aquifer, the second largest aquifer in the world. The complex relationship between this ancient groundwater and the state's surface waters is not well monitored or understood. For now, we are water rich, but are we at risk to becoming water poor? And the need, we, we, we really need to continue the good research that's going on so that we better understand that balance and the connections between surface water and groundwater and what happens if, if we pump so much or what does it take to, to recharge. Volatile weather extremes, from floods to drought in a single year, are further challenging our limited understanding of these naturally variable systems. We really need to understand a lot about how the, uh, the complexity of that whole system works. Uh, because uh, we are, I think, at great risk. Because we have so much water in much of the state, we just take it for granted, and we don't worry very much about how we're managing it. Our biggest challenge when you look to me to the state is to manage that interconnectivity between the two. Um, you know, we have a tremendous resource and um, with our groundwater, and we've got to learn how, how we can utilize that resource to our benefit. And uh, it's a, it's, right now we're trying to manage it at such a minute level because of the effect of stream flows versus groundwater. And uh, I think we have to um, better define how that management process can take place because um, there's a lot of things that are out of our control in, in water. Uh, the hydrological cycle includes a lot of things. And we have to look at the whole cycle. And it isn't the same every year, and it isn't uh, historically. Uh, it, it varies. And so I think that the biggest challenge is, is how do we manage the water so we can continue to develop or live the lifestyle we're, we're accustomed to. Nebraska developed a legal system to manage water before the connection between surface water and groundwater was fully understood. Surface water is managed under the prior appropriate doctrine of 1895 that privileges those who are first in time as also first in right. It was another 80 years before the Groundwater Management Act put limits on the rights of landowners to groundwater. Only since 1996 has the state of Nebraska recognized the link between groundwater and surface water. But by this time, surface waters had already been over-appropriated. Irrigation wells were being installed in record numbers, and groundwater levels in some areas had declined as much as 20 to 30 feet. To ensure greater conservation of this resource, Water experts are now calling for the development and implementation of a comprehensive statewide water management plan. Such a plan would attract research funding and help Nebraskans better prepare for drought and capitalize on periods of overabundance. So even though there's lots and lots of water this year, the long-term impact is there's going to be less water available out of those reservoirs when there's a drought. Those are the kind of sustainability issues you got to go uh-oh, how are we going to deal with that? And this is where the challenge is going to be for irrigation source is that you now have to change your risk assessments because you can't have a multi-purpose pool now as high as what it used to be before this event happened. And so now you're going to have to have a lower multi-purpose pool. But what happens when you have a lower multi-purpose pool is that means the next year when you have a drought, you have less water to pull upon than you had before you changed your risk assessment. And drought did follow the flooding of 2011. In 2012, a deep drought, the worst in 50 years, 
set in across Nebraska and throughout the United States. By year end, Nebraska had endured its driest and hottest year on record. When we know there's a drought and there's no water coming across the state line, do we continue to use the same amount of water we've been using for years, for the last five or six years? Well, I guess I was told in one of those sessions down there that, well, it's our water and we can do with it what we want to. You know, we'll take it if we want to. Well, but maybe you should be rationing that during the shorter periods when, when you know you're going to be coming into those. It's wise use of that, uh, that resource. We ought to be looking at a longer range picture of how we can deal with these surpluses when we have surpluses, not just let them go on down the river, I guess. I as a resource that we all depend on, we also need to be concerned about our water's quality. Growing irrigated corn, we can add a little bit of cheap fertilizer back in the 70s and 80s before we realized that, that not all that fertilizer was used by the crop. What wasn't used was leached to the water table. Once it reaches the water table, there's very little that you can do about it. It's, it's there. The water's contaminated. It's gonna take a very long time for that water to become purified, become uncontaminated. So what do you do? I mean, does that change the value of that resource? I would think so. Water contamination, whether from industry, crop and lawn chemicals, livestock operations, fracking or a pipeline spill, can place serious financial burdens on smaller communities forcing relocation of wells and other high infrastructure costs. We're all downstream of somebody, That's mm -hmm. right. whether it's in time or space, all downstream of somebody. And so what's our responsibilities for the people that are downstream of us? The Ogallala Aquifer amassed its vast system of underground reservoirs over millions of years as material from the rising Rocky Mountains eroded eastward. Because of the aquifer, streams emanating from the sand hills are among the most constant flowing streams in the world. This ancient water also helps to ensure the flow of the Platte River east of Columbus, further guaranteeing flow to support the well fields that serve the growing populations of Omaha and Lincoln. I have to say that the people on the western part of the state, in my personal opinion, are much more conscientious about water conservation than I ever saw in the eastern part of the state. They really take that serious. That's a finite commodity. And why do you think that is? <sighs> Probably because it's so ag-based, so ranch-based, I'm guessing, where maybe on the other part of the state is more uh, municipal, you know, urban areas that they just turn on the tap and they assume the water's there and they don't ask where it came from or how it got there or how clean it was. And out here, you have, you know, you watch the creeks go dry. I think there's both a, um, an urban and a rural um, water uh, perspective. Uh, in other words, uh, the urban perspective in, in Lincoln in particular, where I operate, is that, you know, we just expect that we're going to have good water and have it and have plenty of it. And the system is able to pr um, produce and a more rural and, and or maybe ag agriculturally based economy perspective is of course much more cognizant of the relationship between, um, well, you know, if we don't have enough water, we, we, our economy is gonna suffer mm -hmm. uh, and many other things are gonna suffer. So, and that nature does have its habit of not producing enough water when we need it. So in terms of thinking about what's good water policy, sustainable water policy, one has to take into consideration that pretty broad range of uh, perspectives as to water. West or east, urban or rural, water is Nebraska's lifeblood. It is the most heavily irrigated in the nation, with roughly 8.5 million irrigated acres. 94% of the water used in Nebraska goes to agricultural uses. Roughly 81% of water withdrawn for use in Nebraska is used for groundwater irrigation in the production of livestock and crops. 
surface water irrigation has dropped to 13% of the total. All other uses combined, industry, public supply, mining, and livestock account for roughly 6% of the water used in Nebraska. Wildlife, particularly birds and fish, also depend on this resource. Critical habitat for two endangered species, the interior leased tern and whooping crane, is located along the Platte River in central Nebraska. Many people realize we have a half a million sandhill cranes that stop in the Platte River and pour about $12 million into the Tri-Cities every spring, but they don't realize the other natural resource values that we have in central Nebraska, the 12 million waterfowl that use the rainwater basins every spring. And our board, being that public-private interest, raises a lot of questions about, you know, how do we find the right conservation programs, the right, the right ways to compensate, the right ways to integrate conservation into this production ag landscape so that we find that balance and that, that ability for those, those, those interests to coexist together. And, you know, it, it, economics comes into play, land use comes into play. You know, Nebraska is 97% privately owned. It's 99% in the rainwater basins. So, I mean, we, we have to be very much in context of this, this private land ownership and then finding the ways to put and manage those lands with the right incentives so that we have the ecosystem services, the groundwater recharge, the groundwater quality. You know, how do we relate and come up with the right programs that fit out there? In the Platte River Valley Corridor, balancing water requirements for human and wildlife populations is complicated. The Endangered Species Act has triggered a multi-jurisdictional restoration program with implications for water and land management in the area. Out there in the rainwater basin, though, they're doing some innovative practices where wildlife and farming can coexist uh, and produce wonderful results, you know, down there, and, and, and that's stuff that you do. Yeah, I come at this from an educational standpoint. I'm not an agency or a scientific or ag interest. We're, we're, we simply take the public in and, and, and uh, we see the results of, of you know, the history of Nebraska and, and water is we're a water rich state and so what we want to do we get people from all over the world and all over our country that come here that don't understand the complexities of this this Platte River that they've been driving along on I-80 all this way and how does that and and how can wildlife or how can nature eke out an existence in cooperation with the incredible, wonderful agricultural and industrial complex that is built up in the Platte River? And I think to um, have one dominate the other is to the detriment of the whole system. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think there's more value to Nebraska with a healthy wildlife uh, component than one without it. When habitat and food systems for wildlife become endangered. What does that mean for our own food systems? 